Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets, people, pop culture. I'm Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs and the host of Vegas Rock Dog Radio. On today's show, I'm talking about dogs and babies and body language and how to feed your dog based on how they eat in the wild. So stay right there. Rock Dog Radio, pets, people, pop culture. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Sam. I'm the queen of rock and roll dogs, and this is Vegas Rock Dog Radio. We're a rock and roll show all about pets, people, and pop culture. And we cover a a lot of topics, a lot of topics. But before we get started, let's say good morning to Jim, who's in studio. Hello. And we've got, who else have we got in here today, Jim? Twix and Thornton. Twix and Thornton. What is Twix chewing right uh, now? Let me take a look quick. Are you one of those people? Are you one of those pet he's parents? He's just got the squirrel. He's, uh, he'll be fine. He'll oh, he's got his squirrel. Shot. Are you one of those those pet parents who get in bed at night and you're quiet and then all of a sudden the licking starts? <laughs> you, you just, oh, you can't take it. <laughs> Does that make you grumpy? No, just uh, you can't sleep. Well, I guess a bit grumpy, yeah, but then you just can't sleep. So, um, I... I <laughs> You might you might hear him chomping down on that. It's not a real squirrel, by the way. It's a hard it's, it's a hard a, rubber Kong. Yeah, it's not a real squirrel. It's purple. <laughs> oh my goodness! Lots to talk about today. Lots of stuff happening in the news. There was one one thing I saw in the news, and I can't seem to find the video again. And it's a it's a newscaster trying out a shot collar. And I only caught the beginning of it. Oh, good. Well, my Did phone he turn died. it all the way up when he gave himself a shock? <laughs> no, it was uh, it was a female, uh, and it's a topic we're going to talk about today because it's in the news. It was a female presenter. She didn't put it on her neck. She she just put her fingers on the two little prongs, yeah? Oh, okay. And uh, I only saw them shock her on level one. <laughs> okay. She, she she, w- she flew backwards, <laughs> put it that her. way. She threw, flew backwards and then my phone died and I've been trying to find the video since. But we're going to talk about that as well. Not in great deal, but uh, there's some news that's coming out of Scotland, which is uh, uh, something I want to talk about today. We're going to talk about uh, dogs and babies and we're going and kids, of course. And we're going to talk about uh, how and when you feed your pets and how we get them to feed like they did in the wild. They don't live in the wild. No, they don't. But the biology is still the same. Yep, there's a wild one under my feet right now. I know there is. Chomping down on that squirrel. Oh, my goodness. He's uh, he's a noisy boy, isn't he, Jim? He is. (laughs) So uh, we've just just had Valentine's this week. And... um, Valentine's, you want to tell the people why Valentine's is important for you? Yeah, well, you can tell everyone why it's important for us. (laughs) Well, it's our anniversary, so we've been married a long time. (laughs) Yeah, and tell everybody what you wrote in my card, Jim. Well, I I wished her a happy Valentine's and that I love her very much every day. And? Then I congratulated you on being married to me. (laughs) Congratulated you. (laughs) Congratulated you on being married to me. You deserve congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that one. <laughs> um, oh, do I deserve a medal? I need. Th- ah. I, th- I think I need the medal. <laughs> oh, come on, I do. I put up with more than you do. Oh, please. 
Yankees. I do. Uh, uh, where should we start? Let's start by telling you where to find us on, on the internet because there are other places that you can connect with us. And our main website is vegasrockdogradio.com. And you'll find us on Periscope, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Tumblr, and Instagram. Our blog is The Rock and Roll Dog. And you can find us on the free app at yap.us, Y-A-P-P dot U-S. It's free. Download it. And then download our show, Vegas Rock Dog Radio, onto the actual app itself. You'll be the first in the know when stuff happens over here at, uh, at the show. And, of course, if you do miss the show, which is sad, if you miss the live show, <laughs> you can catch up on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spoke by SiriusXM, and any other podcast app you may have on your phone. Just search Vegas Rock Dog Radio, and there we are. And I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> That's great. <coughs> Gr- caught, caught the mic on the second one. Oh, did I? Well, I caught the mic off on the second one. Oh, you one. cut it off. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa, that was intense. That was it intense. Is, it is allergy season where we are, uh, everybody. The trees are budding and the dogs are itching a little bit more. And Yeah, we're trying to get ahead of coming. it. We're trying to get ahead of it. And each year we try. <laughs> it's uh, with our veterinarian. She's a holistic, uh, integrated veterinarian. And each year we try a 21-day desensitization to the pollens in our area. And we usually only get about seven days in. We only get about seven days in, and uh, we what what we use is our local bee pollen. And as you know, those little grains are really small, and uh, the the protocol is, uh, you know, basically one grain on day one, two on two, day two, three, and then we get to about day seven, and uh, Thornton just can't tolerate it, and she throws up. And we're like, okay, that's the end of that. Um, and she also has one heck of a nose for anything that new that might be in her food. And, well, all dogs are like that, not just her. You can't hide that smell from mm, her. No, you can't. <laughs> you just can't. Uh, I've forgotten who I was. Who did we talk to on the show that talked about? Oh, uh, 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 Dina, Dina Sephiris mm-hmm. from the Cancer Detecting Dogs. And she explained some ve- something very interesting you may not know, and of course we know that dogs have a, m- a much better nose than we have with, I've forgotten how many uh, receptors they have, but she said, imagine this, we can walk into a kitchen and go, mmm, I smell chocolate cake, and she said, your dog will walk in and say, mmm, I smell eggs, flour, milk, pinch of salt that's in there, chocolate that's in there, and uh that's how, and how the they nachos smell. you've been ch- snacking on while you're making all that. Exactly. They smell it all. No wonder get excited around food. So they do smell it all. And of course, Thornton, I think uh, she would just stand over a food and look at me like, oh, really? Really? We've done this before. <laughs> yeah. so you're putting that in my food again? Like, really? <laughs> so we usually get day seven, and there you go. Uh, we've tried local honey. We've tried, we've tried all kinds of things, dietary-wise. Maybe we don't have to do the progressive. Maybe we could just do one crushed up in the food every day, and that might help. No, us. it's not to be every day. It's not to be every day. Or That's the thing. Or so, or But we, we do we do our very, very best with it. But it, it's funny. It's almost like clockwork. I, I swear to God, there will be a day on Facebook or whatever, and everyone that's got a pet will say, Oh, my dog's itching like crazy. And when you think about it, you know, pollen drops down. It's in our hair. It's on our skin. You've been out in your back garden. Same for them. It's in their, It's trapped in their fur. So wiping them down with a damp cloth helps as well. Wipe their faces and their ears when they've been out and their feet. And just do what you do what you can. I mean, I think you just have to do a, a, a lot of things. What, what's the one thing that blooms here that bothers everybody? It's the ragweed. Ragweed. Olive trees. Olive. Now, Mul- uh, mulberry. Yeah, these um, olive trees are banned from being planted. No, it's not olives. It's not. No, I think it's the uh, it's the other tree that has the big invasive root system. What's that oh. all about? It's the it's the odd one. Every time the the weatherman talks about it, no one goes, "Well, who has that tree?" Oh, <laughs> yes, somebody has it in the neighborhood. I'm gonna let me find it here. Which tree is banned? It's a, and it's a, it's a proper ordinance. Because it gives off so much pollen, and uh, it's brutal. It is brutal. 
on our pets and on us. Uh, trees that get up, get up your nose. Uh, mulberry, oh yeah, well, mulberry and the olive. So maybe it's both of them. No, there's definitely... No, the, yeah, it's both of them, actually. The mulberry and the olive trees are banned. And they've been banned for a while. But yeah, they can be wicked. What are the trees with the yellow pollen that's literally a blanket of it on your car and on Those the floor? The sumac, aren't they? I don't know. The but green the green trunk trees? Yes. Yeah, I think they're called sumac. I think you just have to do what you can. And, um, you know, just... Y- it's a little bit of work, you know. Just make sure, you know, they're clean. It's not on their face. It's not on their ears. Try your very, very best to eliminate what you can. But, yeah, that's... Uh, it's rough on them. It's rough on them. So what else? What else? What else were we talking about? We talked about Valentine's. We talked about pollen. <laughs> so, oh, so let's start here. Let's start here. Let's start at... Did you tell everybody where they can find you already? Did you go through your spiel? I did. I did all of that. A million plat- your platforms. Yeah, I did ask people to do that. I said, oh, please post pictures of your pets. I really love seeing them, especially Valentine's. And you know, it was very nice to see how much people just really, really love their pets. And I know other people can look in and go, what? They took their dog to a pet party or they went and had photos taken or they bought presents with their pet. But it's just showing how much they love them. And I don't know how you can knock that. And I see that all the time on social media. Don't knock it. They're being kind to the pets. As long as they're not harming their pets, that's important. But they're just showing how much they love them. They go, oh, I want to just go the extra step. Let's go buy a present for my cat or my dog. And people will knock it. And I think that's absolutely horrible. And the type of people I don't want to be friends with. <laughs> but I do see that. And you know what else I see a, a lot of in on social media? It's very strange when people show a lot of compassion towards animals that are taken out of the wild you know dolphins whales and they don't get to live a a proper natural life in the natural environment and you can see these animals are suffering or like the whales are just they're they're going out of their minds basically and that's why they've got them on antidepressants and they don't get to satisfy how they would feed themselves naturally because someone feeds them and People show compassion and uh, and ca- and they care about that, and then other people like laugh about it, and they go, "Wow, how can you laugh at people who care?" That's strange to me. That's really strange. And maybe, maybe I read this article last night. Probably the longest article I have read in <laughs> the longest time. I thought, is, "Is this a book?" Because it was never ending. And what the topic was, Jim was how, you you know, we talk about reward, uh, well, not just reward, but positive reinforcement training. But reward, obviously, is a big part of that, whether it's, you know, lots of praise, kisses, cuddles, um, treats, whatever. They are finding that, and I want to to find the exact name of this article because it was an incredible read. It was an incredible read. Oh, gosh, let's have a look. See if I can find it. It was actually on the page of Do No Harm Dog Training. Fantastic page that I recommend that you do follow. I mean, really fantastic. And where is it? Oh, please be on here. Please be on here. It was about... Oh, there's the... There's a shot collar news there. Oh, where is it? Are you thinking out loud now while you're Googling? Yes, it was about... It it was about psychopathic children... And I mean, that's something that that's you know scares people. Well, it's kind when, of been in the news it, this week as well. Because people, it has, it really, yeah. really has. But this was so, so interesting. Let me go to Linda Michaels' page here. Oh, good grief! What's going? It mm, looks really, really weird. Oh, that looks really strange. Oh, that looks really weird. But basically, the the premise of it, and I will find the link and we'll, I will put it up. Uh, I, I think the word psychopath gets thrown around a lot, but you know, it's it's very serious. And so what they found was that children displayed psychopathic traits as young as being babies. Where they, How they know that? Because where they observe behaviors, hmm. they did. I think it was in London. They did some some research on newborn babies, and showed their responses when they 
were shown a picture of their parents smiling, you know, their faces, and they were shown a red ball. And the babies that responded favorably to the red ball, <coughs> excuse me, that started to show these traits. Mm. Yeah, to show these traits. Reminds me of the, the movie The Omen, remember? Well, it is a little bit mm. like that. Like when they I was knew he was evil from when yes, he was Yes, and a lot of these parents have said that. I've said that. They said, I knew my my child was evil coming out right from the beginning. When you start to notice behaviors, for example, when they're little and one lady was saying, well, my son tried to strangle my two-month-old baby. And when she, you know, got him off the baby and, and was like, you could have killed the baby. Yeah, I know. Um, and just this lack of understanding the consequences or caring about the consequences but enjoying what they did. And it all, she said, do you realize what you were doing? You could have killed me, could have stopped breathing. And done, yeah, I know. Uh, and I'm going to kill all of you. Yeah. Oh. It, 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 and it was that. And it it, it tracks it tracks these these cases. And That's freaky. That's just like movie stuff. Jim, if you read it, it was really disturbing. Like movie and it's very it's sad. Out. It's very sad because this is not what the, what the article was is how it relates to dog training was – you know, they throw these 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 young kids into these juvenile type prisons because they commit a lot of crimes and they get a lot of pleasure out of hurting animals and people and those kind of things. And uh, they're not faced by it; doesn't bother them because that, and that doesn't stop them. There's no fear response there, as if I do this, this is what's going to happen to me. None whatsoever. The void of that, but it is to do with the brain, of course, and where it's uh, as they say, it's almost like. The part of the brain that understands that is very, very weak. Uh, and so they said, you know, they throw them into these juvenile prison, prisons, and that's your punishment, and that's it. And they found that they just came out and continued to do exactly the wow. same thing. However, there's a facility, oh, and I want to say Manafort, and I could be incorrect because I can't find the article, but I'll find it on the break, where they have a different approach entirely to these kids. And the, Jim, the... The uh, their approach is reward, not reward for for bad behavior, but if you don't do the bad beha- behavior and you restrain from that, you gain credits. And they were really simple things. Hmm. Now these were they they've done some bad things. These it was uh, mainly boys that were in in this facility, so it was things like. They they got privileges to move into different clubs, yeah. And in this club, you can, you know, you can play videos, games, or whatever. In this club, you get to have um, internet radio in your room, uh, and so you they built these points up. It was a point system that got them these privileges, and there was somewhat of a sense of pride that came along with that, because that they were responding better to that than punishment. And just being locked up and just left there. And then when they did their time and released, they just went right they, back to they it. They were no better because they, right. they were just on pause. Well, they what, basically what they were doing were, yes, they were on pause. And they were training their brains to understand, you know, reward-based things. And, and that's a good thing, but I have to do this in order to get the points. And they said it just worked, it worked very, very well. But they tracked them, and they tracked them after they, after they left. They could only, they could only track them through, say, police records to see if they'd reoffended. They obviously could not have any contact with them personally after they left the facility because you know for that client, patients, mm-hmm. you know that that your medical world. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, where there's a privacy thing. Mm-hmm. And they said, I mean, I'm talking like unbelievable drop in them going back to these behaviors. So basically they're trying to train them, their brains into, you know, un- understanding the consequences of their actions and that it's better to not do the actions because the consequence- consequences are really bad. But it was a brilliant article. So they were saying that it just relates directly to dog training too. You use an adverse method to try and train a dog, you're going to end up with an awful result. 
right. an awful result and a dreadful relationship. But reward based and reward, and I, I think people need to understand this with dog training. When they say positive reinforcement, it's not, oh, here, have some treats. It's, oh, and I've heard that term before. Oh, you're just treat pushers. I've seen that online. <laughs> Treats can be one tool that you can use. Some dogs respond purely to telling them what a great job that they did. Mm -hmm. But positive reinforcement is without harming an animal in any way or form, any way, shape or form. And we all know through the research that's been done, and it's not new, is that positive reinforcement works and you have a better relationship with your pets. And they, th it, it was on the same lines of thinking. But it was scary reading, you know, when someone gets diagnosed as a psychopath, you, you're reading what these parents were thinking, and it was horrific. And that's how, they said that one woman said her daughter at six was admitted into a facility. At six years old, because she couldn't be left around at home with the family members or the pets. At school, she was really horrible, wanting to harm and enjoying harming other people. And it was such, such an interesting article, such an interesting article. And I will find it and I will post it for you. But I think that leads right into the news that came out of Scotland. And that's the the banning of the shock collar. Now, currently in Wales, yep, currently in Wales, which is part of the United Kingdom, they've already banned it. We've not banned it yet in England and it needs to happen. But it, it's moving and it's getting there. But Scotland, here we go. Let me uh, read you this. The uh, Roseanne Cunningham, she said, causing pain to dogs with inappropriate training methods was unacceptable. The use of electric shock collars for dogs is to be banned in Scotland. And the Scot Scottish government announced that. That is such a great thing to hear. Environment Secretary Roseanne Cunningham said, causing pain is just an inappropriate training method. And it's completely unacceptable. And I'm right behind that. Well, the the um, don't most law enforcement agencies around the world that's the standard training. So yeah, and I know Victoria still really stems from that. No, it doesn't stem from that. Well, I mean at all. that's why that's why it's not been really banned everywhere. No, because I don't think most people know about it. Uh, I don't think most people know about it. Victoria Stillwell has been working with police uh, departments to get them to change their training methods from uh, in the states. She's been doing it. And uh, she's getting them to change their, their methods. So that's, a, that's something we'll talk about in another show as well, is where else are these electric collars being applied that you're not aware of. And, you know, it's time to come into, you know, into the current world <laughs> of training. Like, come on, we're dragging you, kicking and screaming, mm. because oh. there's, no, there's no place for that. That's just, it's unacceptable. Well, the ban will be introduced through guidance um, issued under the Animal Health and Welfare Scottish uh, Scotland Act, 2006 and it's been welcomed by animal charities and campaigners including the Scottish Conservative M MSP Morris Golden whose petition calling for the devices What's to be MSP? It'll be a um, uh, an MP is a member of parliament but it's a member of Scottish parliament oh. for Scotland MSP. We, we need to know that. Oh sorry. Sorry. <laughs> well, I know my British listeners know that. Mm -hmm. I'm a Scottish ones definitely know that. <laughs> but yeah that's uh, we call them MPs. Um, and the petition called for the devices to be outlawed, and it attracted over 19,000 signatures. Now, Ms. Cunningham said, after careful consideration, uh, c carefully considering the concerns raised by stakeholders and the public about electronic training collars for dogs, particularly the ready availability on the Internet of cheap devices, which can be bought by anyone, bought by anyone and used to deliver painful electric shocks, I've decided to take steps to effectively and promptly ban their use in Scotland. Ooh, I love her. Uh, causing pain to dogs is inappropriate, clearly unacceptable. And I want there to be no doubt that painful or unpleasant, and I think that's key, unpleasant training for dogs will not be tolerated. Here's the thing. Who wants to be shocked? Who wants to be taken by surprise? That's a terrible thing. That's like that's like me standing around every corner in the house that you walk down the hallway and I jump out at you. Yeah, like you do sometimes. I do sometimes. I don't do it. All the time. But can you imagine for every move that you ever made that I fear is, I th feel is a undesirable thing for you to do, that I frighten you to death? So and our animals don't want to be, well, they don't want to be frightened. They don't want to be shocked. They don't want to be taken by surprise. And they don't want to be hurt. They don't want to be hurt. And 
do you want your dog to fear you? Because it will. It's as simple as that. I would fear you. I would fear you if I got smacked every time I did something I didn't like. Is that, why, like. I, is that why I fear you? You do not fear me at I all. Do. You're smacking me around, scaring <laughs> me all the time. Okay. Please. <laughs> she said she is uh, particularly keen to support the work of Scottish um, enforcement agencies with effective and practical measures so that anyone found causing pain to dogs through the use of collars or other devices, love this, can be prosecuted as they deserve. So I'm hoping that includes choke collars, prong collars. That's what I'm hoping. Uh, now we'll keep on top of this. Um, she said, I will therefore be issuing strong ministerial guidance on the use of all painful training devices for courts to take into consideration in any cases brought before them regarding unnecessary suffering through the use of these de- devices. The government said guidance, guidance would be finalised in the coming months. However, initial draft guidance was published on Wednesday. Uh, one kind director, Harry uh, Hewton, said electric shock calls are cruel, unnecessary and ineffective. I'm delighted that the Scottish government has today taken a stand against cruelty and taken decisive de- action against their use. Mr. Golden, who is due to lead a members' debate on the issue at Holyrood on Thursday, so this was last week, I am very pleased the Scottish Government is finally announcing a ban on the use of electric shock collars for dogs, that they have listened to our campaign and to the 20,000 people who signed my petition. There's a lot of ignorance surrounding shock collars. There's a lot of ignorance, and it's hard not to to jump in on some of these comments to try and try and educate people it's quite hard to educate anybody on social media it really is honestly and uh, there was there are a lot of people still in favor of them and and i feel that people are using them based off a myth or based off what a trainer told them or this is the way uh, we were just talking about this the other day with one of my other friends well, why do you do it that way? Because that's the way we always do it. Well, yeah. Why do you always do it that way? Well, because that's we always the way do it that way. we <laughs> yeah. always do it that way. Well, I think that's it. I think often things are passed down generation to generation because it's what you did as a generation. You know, oh, my parents did that. Oh, my grandparents did that. Therefore, it must be okay. And and it is a matter of questioning people and asking them, but why? And here's another thing, I think, another myth, and I, I read it a lot yesterday, which was, yes, but, you know, in the wrong hands, it can be used as a torture tool. I mean, if it's used the right way, in any hands, it's the wrong way. In in, in any hands is the wrong way. It may not be your intention because you may not know. You may not know. But in any hands, it's incorrect. And here's the thing. What you what you do is you you end up with a fearful dog, and we know what happens with fearful dogs. Their only defense is to to bite, snap, and to protect themselves. And can you imagine always, you know, you're getting zapped. I mean, you're just getting zapped, and it's really dreadful. It's really dreadful. So there was someone on yesterday. As I say, I don't normally comment on anything, but make sure I am very respectful on social media. But I did say to one lady. And she was saying, and it, clearly someone who didn't know, she goes, oh, yeah, my my uh, trainer told me, well, here's the thing, shark collar trainers, they want to make money. Of course, they're not going to tell you it's going to harm your dog psychologically or physically. But she said, my trainer said it was great, used the right way. Do you know what was amazing? She said, I, I wanted to, I, and this is what I found interesting, I wanted to be able to walk in the countryside with my dog off leash. I wanted to do that. What she didn't want was her beagle, to enjoy nature and be a beagle, which is if they see something, they're going to chase it. You're out in nature. She didn't want the dog to be normal, <laughs> to do n- normal dog behavior. She wanted this for her. And then she said, the first time I got to take my dog off the leash and him walk by, you know, walk with me, I cried. I, I cried happy tears. I was so happy. And there was a gentleman posted something before me who was really respectful. And he said, oh, I'm afraid that's not, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be crying happy tears because what, what you've done there is you've not, I know you feel like you accomplished something, which you did. Yeah, your dog got to walk off a leash, but at what cost? At what it cost? It was afraid to be itself. It was afraid to be itself. It's afraid of you. It's afraid to be hurt. You've done it a million times. You've zapped it from, from walking away from you. That was your result. So when people say it works... It works at what cost? I think that's the the question. It works at what cost? Uh, we had uh, someone say, someone say to me, "I want to be able to." I oh, it's hard for me to walk my dogs, and they need a walk. 
so she really cared about the fact that they needed to walk, needed exercise at the cost of hurting them. <laughs> I'm going to hurt my dog so I can give them the walk that they need. So you, you see, I think it, it's not until I think you ask questions. Another one is, oh, well, they don't feel it. And, and then the, 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 the question back is, so how does it work? Uh, <laughs> they don't feel it. How does it work? And and so, like you say, a lot of it is myths. I've heard it a million times. That must be true. And we know the research has been out there forever and a day. And there was some research that was done in England. And it was done with shock collars and positive reinforcement training. Positive reinforcement training worked. Duh. No dog was harmed. No relationship was broken. No bond was broken. And the dog wasn't fearful. Uh, so I'm very pleased to hear about that. Very, very pleased to hear about that. I think it's great news. And it's time. I mean, seriously, w what decade? What de What century are people in where they feel it's okay to harm an animal to try and get it to do what they want it to do? And I think you also have to ask, am I asking my dog not to be a dog? <laughs> am I asking my dog not to smell at anything in it when we go on a walk in the countryside? Am I asking my dog not to react when it sees a bird in a tree? Am I asking my dog to not be a dog? And I think that, and that makes me sad. That makes me really, really sad. So that's the news coming out of Scotland. I think it's a great piece of news. We're very happy about that. And, uh, you know, the psychology article that I read about reward, pretty good. You know, any rewards is a pretty good thing. Well, on that note, let's take a quick break because when we come back, we're going to talk about the whole feeding thing. I was... Uh, uh, alluding to at the beginning of the show. So we'll be right back. You're listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio with me, Sam, your host, the queen of rock and roll dogs. Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets. People. Pop culture. Pet Scene Magazine is dedicated to Las Vegas pets and the people who love them. It's a source of news and information for pet lovers, as well as offering valuable coupons and specials on pet products and services. Find them online at www.lvpetscene.com or look for them on Facebook. At Carl's Jr., not only do we make you happy with our delicious charbroiled burgers, we also make your dogs happy. Come through our drive through with your furry friends and we'll offer them a treat. We love to see their smiling faces. Our website, CarlsJuniorOfLasVegas.com, has a treat in store for its customers too. With free coupons anytime, so visit us often. Carl's Jr. is a proud and active supporter of animal adoption in our community. You can find us at CarlsJuniorOfLasVegas.com. Vegas Rock Dog Radio, pets, people, pop culture. Hello, everyone. Let's t let's talk about let's talk about food, <laughs> which I've not had any this morning. I'm hungry, Joe. Okay. Where are you taking me for lunch? Uh, the kitchen. <laughs> I bet you are. We have no food in the house. What's wrong? Isn't that sad? That's so sad. Let me tell you about this. Let me find. Oh. I hope I didn't lose it. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, my gosh. I'm scrolling up and down on this iPad like a maniac trying to find my my article. I hope I didn't lose it. Oh, here we go. A uh, page that I follow is the Royal Animal Health University's page. Yeah? And a topic that you're going to hear more and more about on social media, people asking questions, and it end up being, it'll end up being the buzzword is fasting you're going to hear about fasting that's what you're doing today fasting yeah i am <laughs> and i say it's getting some chitter chatter on social media so i went over to their page the royal animal health university page did a little bit of reading over there and i found something quite interesting now let me tell you about the the, the acronym for the royal animal for royal animal health university is rahu 
and it's dedicated to teaching and advocating a hands-on, holistic, innovative and common sense approach to all aspects of animal care. Their effective science-based integrated veterinary summits and webinars are designed to help caregivers from pet parents to industry professionals to veterinarians as they improve their options for the health of animals, their environment, our environment and our planet. Great source of information, I have to tell you that. It's Dr. Barbara Royal. I really love that last name. <laughs> She's the founder of the uh, the organization and the rest of the team is very impressive. She's got Natasha Lilly, Karen, Dr. Karen Becker, Steve Brown. He's the author of, of uh, some best-selling canine nutrition books and, of course, Rodney Habib. So I can't imagine a much better team in all honesty. So I will put the link up. I would like you to be able to go over there and, and read some of the great information that's available to you. But this is what I found about fasting. And this is from uh, from the page. <coughs> Gosh, I'm coughing and sneezing. What's going on? Right into your mic. I didn't. I'm your engineer can't catch your mic in time when you do that. Carry on like that. Yeah. Well, That's exactly what I did. Mm. It's telling me off now. Yeah. Yes. Okay, here we go. Fasting. It is a natural part of most animals' lives. Did you know that, Jim? I did not know that, but they probably go in the wild. In the wild. As they go, oh, I didn't catch that one oh. today, and I'm tired, so I might have to catch it tomorrow. <laughs> as food is not always plentiful or regularly available in the wild, yeah? Nature is conservative and uses this fasting time to heal the body and make cells ready for the next meal. Dogs are particularly good at tapping into their ability to self-heal when their stomachs are empty. And when there's food, there is, of course, active growth and development. When empty, the body can focus on cleanup, that is necessary before the next intake of food. And what they mean by cleanup is managing inflammation, killing cancer cells, reconstructing poorly functioning cells. And the body can focus on this task when it's at, at its best when it's actually in between meals. So it's very much like humans, uh, especially, you know, you go to bed and you say that's where you're going to regenerate and you heal when you sleep. Um, you got a lot of regeneration last I night. I didn't sleep last night. That's the problem. What? Yeah, I got late because I didn't sleep last night. What were you doing? Not sleeping very well. Well, first of all, we should not fall asleep on the sofa. Oh, to fall asleep on the settee is a nightmare. It's all right. The first five minutes, you know, you get all comfy, snuggly. You got the dog, the TVs on. You're like, oh, this is great. And it's the best thing and the worst thing because you wake up at three o'clock in the morning, which is what I did with my neck all bent up. Is thinking, that what time it was? Yes, it oh, was. Oh, no wonder. And that's not a good night's sleep. And then by the time I let the dogs out for a wee-wee, because now they thought it was morning time. <laughs> by the time I got into bed, I was wide awake uh, when I should have been regenerating and healing in my sleep. Um, this is what I found interesting. If you feed your dog at the same time every day, the body starts to develop a clock that starts acid production and salivation in preparation for the meal, which is not totally normal in nature. That makes sense. Overproduction of the acid may lead to pH imbalances that can potentially alter the population of naturally occurring GI bacteria. Yeah, gastrointestinal bacteria. Meal times in nature are a more random occurrence, which, to be honest with you, they are in our house. <laughs> Not just for the dogs, but for me and Jim. Like today, we have no food in the house, so we're fasting. Uh, so when applied to your dog... Uh, it's a way to help your dog engage their natural self-healing abilities. And they are they are suggesting you feed your dog at random times to help them be able to comfortably fast as they are never certain when meal time is, which is kind of true with, with us. It is, we're not habitual. It's not, oh, you know, at 8 a.m. they get a breakfast and at 5 p.m. they get a dinner. Although the interesting thing is the dogs obviously have this internal clock too, and oh, I got it this morning. Yeah, where well, they come and they come and nudge you and bark in your face. Say, What's up? Where's the dinner? So we, we, clearly they're getting onto that track of doing that. And that's something they've done recently. So we need to we need to mix it up a little bit more. Uh, but when you apply it to your dog, uh, it will help them engage that natural self healing ability. Additionally, if your dog, uh, if if your adult dog is over twenty five pounds, they suggest feeding them once daily. And they suggest feeding an adult adult dog no more than twice twice a day. So you don't want to be leaving food out either. 
the whole grazing thing. I, I talked to someone this week about that. And they said, well, I just leave it out there. And if they eat it throughout the day, then I add more. And they have an overweight dog. They have well, a very it's overweight It's interesting, dog. you know, because a friend of mine, on that same note, I had to train him a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah. They bought a very low-grade food and a kibble-based food. And uh, they go, well, we just leave the food out and they eat throughout the day. And I'm like, uh, maybe because they don't like it and they only eat because they <laughs> have to because you're not giving them anything else. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, I got him to try, you know, the good food that that we use. And he says, oh, my goodness. He goes, I make that food up and they're uh, waiting for me drooling. They eat it and it's gone. Well, it go, tastes mm, good. Well, they like that food then, don't they? Yeah. And, uh, and what what we're using right now, we're going to be going to a full raw diet um, soon, is we're using a base mix. And uh, the base mix uh, is then hydrated with water. So they get all the moisture and then their raw protein goes in there. And of course, a dog's going to much prefer that over, <laughs> over some dry kibble. There are, of course, better kibbles than others. Some are really bad, low grade, and will not, your pet won't thrive. It might sustain them, but they're not going to thrive, and it's probably not very tasty well, either. A, he never thought, well, you leave the food out and they just eat throughout the day. Yeah, they probably just don't like it. <laughs> they're probably like, oh, God. That again. And it's boring for them, at least if you if you do a partial raw or full raw diet. You get to rotate, and there's lots of variety, and it's fresh. It's fresh, and it's, uh, it's a, a preferred way of feeding them. I, mean, I think even if people cook their, their dog's meat, in, and they're doing a, a very well balanced in that, and that's how, let me tell you something. You, you've got to put your work in to make sure you are giving your your dogs everything that they need when you home feed them. You've got to read up, and we've got great resources for you. One of them is Ronnie Habib. The other one, Dr. Karen Becker. The other one is Keep the Tail Wagging. You'll learn a lot. You'll learn a lot. You know, and you can take your time. You know, preparing before you actually jump in to feed with that. You can start by adding some fresh fr- fruits and veg and understanding how much you need to feed them in addition to their, their normal food while you learn all this stuff. And there's a lot to learn. It's continually uh, changing as they learn more and more about about nutrition for pets. But we're certainly in a much better position than we were 10 years ago. It's unbelievable. But, yeah, and, of course, the dogs like that, Jim, because, yeah, what, yeah not appealing a little dry pebble, <laughs> and they need their moisture. Really important. So remember, the, they said remember the space between these meals can be just as important as the meals themselves. Now, sh- this this information is based on these recommendations are based on dogs that consume a species appropriate, moisture appropriate diet, and um, we might be on that same path, Jim, because <laughs> there's n- there's nothing happens at the same time every day in our house. <laughs> there are it just isn't. Oh, that's because you're very odd. Uh, well, I kind of like living that way. I don't like. I don't like um, the same thing happening at the same time. I just don't like them. Never have. Hmm. It's, it's monotonous. It's boring. It's. I like variety. It's the spice of life. Oh, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I really love that. Well, let's move on to. As I say, that's Rahu, Royal Animal Health. Oh, uh, let me let let me let me let me let me get you that name right. It is the Royal Animal Health University. You can find that on on Facebook. Let's take a quick break. I'll tell you what, let's take a quick break. We're talking about babies and dogs, babies and dogs. When we come right back, you listen to Vegas Rock Dog Radio with me, Sam, your host, the Queen of Rock and Roll Dogs. Vegas Rock Dog Radio: Pets, People, Pop Culture. Welcome. To Barking Dog Self-Washing Grooming, your one-stop shop for all your pet's needs. We offer premium natural pet foods, full-service grooming, and an on-site bakery and boutique. You can choose to self-wash your dog or schedule a luxury pampering with our professional groomers. Visit our Cool Cat section, offering feline food, toys, bedding, and litter, while the Adventurous Dog Department has everything you need for your outdoor activities. And don't forget Cody's Healing Garden, featuring flower, aromatherapy, and herbal remedies for pets. Find us at www.barkingdogslv.com, and we look forward to seeing you in our neighborhood. Vegas 
Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets, people, pop culture. Hello, everyone. As promised, we're going to talk about dogs and babies. If you're just listening in, I'm Sam. I'm the queen of rock and roll dogs, and you're listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Okay, here we go. This is another one of those things. You know, the internet's a great thing. Social media, I, I really enjoy social media when it's positive <laughs> and you can learn something. But also, it's kind of a, well, as you know, lots of people think they're going, they want to get famous through, through social media, no matter what level of fame they think that is in their mind. And often you'll see people do things, uh, be it video-wise or photographs, to get those likes and shares and, you know, you know like that TV series we watched. Yeah, on Black Mirror. <laughs> yeah, that was quite disturbing. But they sometimes do it at the cost of uh, a pet safety, um, a child safety, and it, often people just look at it for, you know, their first impression. Oh, that's cute. That's fun. But often some of those things can be quite dangerous. And it's one of those things, too, that when you when you point that out on social media, I see people get attacked over it. They go, you know, that's a really dangerous behavior. That dog is not enjoying that. If you look at the dog's body language, it's showing you, it's giving you warning signs. Stop doing that. This makes me uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, there's always someone that says, oh, the animal activists, get ready in three, two, one, are going to make a comment. And, again, it's that whole weird thing of, Oh wow! I'm caring about a situation, an animal or a child that you've put in a situation, and that's bad because what? It's a very weird thing, very weird. But one of those topics I've I've wanted to cover. It's a very big top, very very big topic. Is you know, babies and dogs. It's a really, you know, big big topic. Um, and it's funny because I think. The, the the internet is a very good indicator of what people understand and what they actually know about pets you know what do they, how what do, do they know about nutrition training body language um what they post gives them away it gives them away and there's a lot of people that are that are operating on 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 myths and a lot of what they do is based on on myth and and one of those things is how dogs interact with babies you know so you see those videos and the dogs licking the baby's face and look at the baby's toes and those kind of things so this is the topic i want to cover yeah i'm not going to say anything right now because i'm just thinking about jokes yeah let's not think about jokes so, right now uh, <laughs> i would love to see this year i think training's going to come to the forefront this year Nutrition, as I said last year, I thought would be a very big topic and it's continuing to be this great trend. I think training is going to be not, I think people are going to look a little bit more into training, not just getting your dog to do commands, but you understanding body language. And I think this is where this topic comes in. And um, every Tuesday, and I do love this. The uh, Reisner Veterinary Behavior Services, they always do a Tuesday's Pearl. <laughs> they had a Saturday, oh, a Saturday something, what was it? I can't remember, but the Tuesday's Pearl was, your dog doesn't need to protect the baby. Yeah? And uh, they consult with a lot of uh, people who are pregnant or, or waiting to adopt a child or thinking of becoming pregnant. And... A lot of people are concerned. I've got pets and I'm bringing a baby into the home. So there's a big level of anxiety, of course, that comes with that. And, um, you know, it's a big change for the dog. It's a huge change. You know, you've got your separation anxiety. Uh, all of a sudden, who's this new person, little thing that just showed up? Uh, there's uh, understanding their position in the house and may, may not be getting as much attention as they normally get. Those kind of things. Big, big shift for dogs. I, I don't feel enough people prepare anyway for a baby to come home and what that means to the dog. I think people bring the baby home and go, oh. And the dog just oh, immediately gets ignored. Or yeah, well, yes, and I've seen it, and it's heartbreaking. Yet, you see other people who took the time to readjust what they do on a daily basis, similar to what it's going to be like when baby comes home. And that's one of the best things people can do. You're probably going to do much, much shorter walks. 
So you get your dog accustomed to a shorter walk. Uh, you start to create some boundaries at home where the dog can't go in the baby's room and those kind of things. But a lot of people don't. Most people don't. I'm going to say most people don't. And the next thing you know, I've got to get rid of my dog, which is the worst thing you could ever ever do. I mean, it's dreadful. Your pets have been everything to you in your life and been with you all the time. And then all of a sudden, oh, i got a baby now. Oh, dog's got to go. And that's usually out of their own fear or a lack of preparation. I'm going to have to cough again. Sorry. <coughs> I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I have no idea. Um, and like they pointed out, and I, I just mentioned, the internet is riddled with these photos to become viral. You know, it translates into clicks, which translates into money for lots of people. And most people say, oh, that's so cute, how the dog is interacting with the baby. Um, but for, for a lot of people, including myself, I see those photos. And, and, and like the behaviorist says in this article, my toes curl um it, it, it they're potentially dangerous and it's uh something you can avoid it's something you don't ever want to put your kids in a position where something could happen so this was the um this was the you know the things that that she observed and in some of these photos and these videos and she does give these great examples but these are common scenarios uh, the dog seems alarmed when the baby cries, circling uh, the bassinet and it's whining. The dog pokes on or pushes her closed muzzle onto the baby's foot, face or other body parts. Dog tries to cover the baby with a blanket. And that's called food cacheting, by the way. Uh, the dog intensely sniffs the baby's face, clothing or diaper. The dog rests his head on the baby. The dog licks the baby persistently or frantically. The dog becomes hyper vigilant and quickly approaches when the baby is placed into a play yard, bassinet, or on the floor. Pa uh, parental maternal behavior, they say, is not common towards newborn babies from a dog. It's not. Uh, but it, she says it does, it does seem to occur anecdotally that as parents describe dogs' behavior that they're perceiving as caregiving. But she says it's much more likely the dog is fearful. And so she gives these examples of these images, and you can go back to the images, and she'll say, you know, one, two, three, six, and seven photographs that shows a fearful dog. One through seven shows a worried dog. Uh, predatory behavior is shown in all of these photos, and a confused dog is shown in, you know, one through seven. So you can actually go back and spot them and see them, and I think that's where this great level of education comes in. She says, to be safest, a, a newborn baby should never be placed in any vulnerable position in which the dog has unrestricted access to the baby's face or body. Initial introductions can take place after the excitement has died down with the baby held securely and swaddled in an adult's arms. The dog can be brought in on a lead. That's really important. The lead held by a responsible adult. Dogs are perfectly aware of the presence of the baby without needing to touch, sniff, or taste. They know it's there. They've seen it. They smell it. And just as with any introduction to something potentially scary or strange, because it, it's foreign, think about this, the dog should be calmly redirected, reassured, and fed by the leash holder. And if sniffing is permitted, it should only uh, it should be only when all is calm, the dog is on, on, on the lead, and a little bit of foot or hand is available for investigation when the dog immediately then the dog is immediately redirected and led away once again uh, lots of happy voices have to ensue you know happy environment um and uh, they've got some great information this uh, organization is called there's an organization called family pause and it's familypause.com and um she says we all imagine that our dogs will be bonded and protective around children Bonding can come, but later when the baby grows into a child. In reality, the best response to a baby is for your dog to be initially curious, but soon over it. Sleeping through the fussing, playing or crying and acting generally unimpressed or unconcerned is what you're looking for. And if your dog looks bored by the new family member, you can rest a little easier. And we do see those awful situations where babies, little kids, babies are, you know, toddlers are bitten and everybody is surprised by that but if you leave a child uh, unattended or you don't manage the situation properly that's the situation you're going to be in but don't be fooled when you see these photos and go oh and someone says oh, my dog's being a really good mama to the baby mm -mm, it's not <laughs> and don't copy that don't copy that I thought that was a great article but there is this organization who I'd like to get on the show and talk about this further I think about four years ago we talked about this about 
you know, preparing way ahead of the baby showing up, way mm-hmm. ahead as, as to how you're going to manage this. And I think that's really important. But a friend of mine recently had a baby and she said, she said, I don't know how people could get rid of their pets. It's You can share your love between your pets and your kids. It's not a one or the other at all. Love is love. And we're a happy little family. And uh, that was just wonderful. She shows it can be done. You don't have to surrender your pets. You really don't. Right, Jim. What time do we have left? You only have about four minutes left. Okay. And I've got a very, very short, short topic, really short topic here. Um, not the best thing, but it's a warning. Uh, yesterday, a friend of ours was a witness to a dog choking on a tennis ball. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Remember when we were in the park that time up in Anthem and, and we'd heard that that had just happened in the park? Yeah, yeah. The dog was actually running. The ball was thrown. The dog run, ran, caught the ball, ball. The dog fell over. The ball went back and lodged into its throat. Yeah. And it died there in the park. And this is what, what uh, a friend of ours witnessed yesterday. Um, and it's common. It's really common. It's really common. And, and you just don't want that to happen. But basically, um, this this person we know was called for help can you come and help can can we do cpr what can you do but it was too late it was too late and the dog walk, walker tried to dislodge the ball which was stuck at the back of the throat and in the process she was bitten very badly well of course she would be you know and a dog that's panicked uh, and was not breathing because the dog was um oh she said because the dog was panicked and their wrist was broken while trying oh my goodness and it's tragic on all fronts and it certainly is but what can you do and she says, size matters. Of course it does. Choose a ball way, way much bigger than the dog's throat. And, you know, just make sure it's something. If you're in doubt, just, you know, always get a much bigger toy, chew toy, a much bigger chew bone, a much bigger ball. Because you can't really even do the dog Heimlich maneuver mm. for that. because That's wedged, and you've got to try and get your hands in there. That's just really sad. And, uh, you know, you make sure you just throw balls at appropriate size. And she says, I mean, choose balls that are way too big for your dog. Uh, um, and she shows an example of that. It's just, that's just really, really sad, completely avoidable, it, really sad. Ugh, and I can't imagine what she felt like trying to help and, and, and it didn't turn out the way they hoped it would. Um, wow. Wow. And she said also, and this is a good tip, put, if they, if the ball is used for fetch time, and playtime, then put them away after. Make sure they just don't have access to them while you're not around. Wow. And she said, learn the Heimlich. You should always you've got to be able to try everything you possibly can. Be prepared. Wow. So that you can try and save a dog's life. And uh, number three, if your dog who destroys tennis balls, don't get tennis balls anymore. When they chew off the felt of a tennis ball next is they break the ball. Broken tennis balls are more likely to be swallowed and the sharp broken edges will tear the lining of internal organs. And uh, I think that's very, very good advice. Very good advice. Totally avoidable. And um, just like we talked about pet suffocation with snack bags, you got to chop them up because you can avoid any kind of pet suffocation by chopping up snack bags, putting your snacks in in containers, eating from a bowl instead of a bag. All those things will make a difference. And um, keep your pets nice and safe. You want to avoid any kind of tragedy at all costs. Oh, and finally, one more thing. One more thing. Finally, it's very, very quick. There's um, the very first, Egypt's first dog cafe proves a, a hit. Egypt. Egypt. Most people in Egypt feel dogs should not be touched or kept as pets. I didn't know that. I, I wasn't sure aware that they were, I, I, w- I was aware that they're not like the biggest animal lovers, but I didn't know that. But one owner in Alexandria is catering for the growing trend in owning so that's a good move that's a really good move i'll put that link up for you so you can see that i think that's great well on the note oh one other thing i just heard that the the people who are trying to put a cat cafe together here in town have got the location downtown excellent and they open in april so we'll keep you updated on that for our vegas residents it's uh that's fun it's gonna be fun the first of its kind in town All right, everyone. I'm so glad you were here for the show today. If you've liked the show, I'd love for you to share it, especially if you're listening on your smartphone. It's quite easy to hit that share button, tell your friends about it. We hope that with every single show, you come away having learned a little nugget of truth (laughs) that helps you be a better pet parent so that your pets can have the best life possible. And remember, you can help an animal in need 
Either a rescue, adopt, donate, volunteer or share their information. Rescue your next family member. Replace the workshop with adopt. And be kind to all animals. Thank you, Jim, for pushing the buttons today. Uh, my dogs, they were just uh, cute as ever, just laying there. Got to love that. Take a moment to like our Facebook page and post pictures of your pets on our page and tell us how much you love them and why you love them. And today you've been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio, where it is all about pets, people, and pop culture. I'm your host, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs. And always kiss your pets good morning and good night. And I'll see you next time. You've been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets, people, pop culture. Visit Vegas Rock Dog Radio for more information. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe on iTunes and iHeartRadio. And remember, give your fur babies a big kiss from me, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs. You must not rely on the information in this broadcast from our host as an alternative to medical advice from your veterinarian. If you have any specific questions about a medical matter regarding your pets, you should consult your veterinarian or specialist. 